Good morning. I welcome you to Frank and Mary on Nantucket. Tammy Pozzaricki is here on Nantucket and has is going to be doing a fabulous presentation for us on It Takes a Village. And It Takes a Village is right. Um, it takes a village to create a memory cafe. And um, this presentation, I'm gonna tell people all about what it is, what is a memory cafe, how it relates to dementia-friendly communities, because I know Nantucket is um, starting efforts to really make Nantucket dementia friendly and what does that mean? So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Well, thank you so much for not only coming to Nantucket but for speaking to us on this very important issue and we are indeed working on getting a memory cafe started sooner rather than later. Sooner rather than later. Wonderful. And I was delighted to be able to introduce the two of you because Tammy Pozzaricki is actually from my hometown. Her, she's run a memory cafe in Marlboro, Mass. Uh, which was the first in Massachusetts. And, and as a piece of being a dementia-friendly community, having a place where you and your loved one can go on a regular basis to be totally safe and not embarrassed and feeling like you're at, at home, just a wonderful thing. So it's great that you're down. Allison, I'm delighted that she was able to come down. We look forward to having you watch the special edition of Frank and Mary here in Nantucket. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tammy Pozzaricki. I own Alternatives in Alzheimer's Care. Uh, I am based in, I live in Northborough, and I have been in the healthcare field for about 23 years as a social worker, and I work with families and people living with dementia. So just a show of hands, how many folks have been touched by some form of dementia? whether you know someone personal. Um, we are dealing in a world of the epidemic of dementia. Um, but as you heard in the last presentation, the biggest treatment is socialization, actually. And um, I'm gonna talk a lot to you today about the benefits and what is a memory cafe. Has anybody heard about a memory cafe? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so now what I do professionally is that I train healthcare professionals. I consult with organizations on how to better care for individuals who are living with the disease. Um, have you heard of dementia-friendly community? Huge effort moving across the world, actually, to make a better place for those affected with the disease. Um, my mission now is to work to make a dementia-friendly health care system. Our hospitals, our assisted livings, our home cares, our community. So let's talk today about how we can do that in Nantucket. Um, first, the history of a memory cafe. Dr. Beer Meissen actually started it in Europe, 1997, and in Europe, they are very far ahead of what we've done in, as far as becoming dementia friendly, but we're a close second, so we're getting there. Dr. Lockvig was the first person to start a cafe in the United States in New Mexico. I take credit for starting the first one in Massachusetts in 2011 where no one knew what this concept even was. So myself, I had an entertainer, we had lots of food, we had volunteers, and we sat there by ourselves for a good few months until it caught on. Um, now, you can't even count how many. The documented ones, there's, gosh, over definitely over 100 in Massachusetts now. And throughout the country, I say it's a lot more than 500, but they're not all accounted for on the directories. But we do have a few directories out there online that give you the location. But let's first talk about what it is a and what it is not, because that's important to understand. So a memory cafe is an environment that someone who's passionate about the disease offers to the caregiver and the person who is living with dementia. 
it is an opportunity for them to get out of what always happens, isolation and withdrawal. Depression and dementia go hand in hand. The caregiver of the person living with dementia has depression too. How can we get them out and engaging? Because socialization is the number one treatment, not only for the person living with it, but also the family member or the caregiver. But these are all the benefits. We want to eliminate isolation. We want to provide an environment where the person doesn't even think about the disease. It's not about the disease. In fact, the European model that Dr. Beer Meissen set up initially was all about support, education, and would have lectures. And Dr. Lockvig, she liked that model, but she said, no, we're going to have a party. We're going to make a fun time for these people who are otherwise isolated at home and not engaging in their community. So every cafe is unique. That's wonderful because we actually, in our area, which we consider the Metro West area, we have about a dozen cafes and we call our members cafe hoppers because they'll go from one to another <clears throat> and maybe attend five or six in a week's time. That's their outlet. That's their connectedness. And we need to be connected as humans. What it is not, it is not a support group. It is not a marketing opportunity for those entities or are helping to support the cafes. Just some pictures, this is an actual book, The Alzheimer's uh, Cafe. The Alzheimer's Cafe is really what Dr. Lockvig called it. Um, most cafes are getting away from labeling it. We call it the Memory Cafe. The first one that I created was Create a Better Day Cafe because that was my tagline for my day program business that I had. Um, and in that book, I'm on page 55, is the first cafe in Massachusetts. So it's exciting. This is a great book if anybody's interested in learning more about them. Um, a couple of pictures from cafes. These are the benefits to attending. And as I said before, it's an accepting environment. It's supportive. It's leave the disease at the door, come in, and we're going to welcome you no matter where you're at in the disease process. So I've had a son go an hour away, pick up his mother who lives in a nursing home, wheelchair bound, and that was their activity for the Sunday. A nice drive for an hour and come into a wonderful accepting environment with his mom and together they could enjoy it. And what is the benefit to the caregiver? Well, it's essentially not a support group, but they meet other caregivers. They actually know, wow, look at all these other people who are dealing with this terrible thing. But everybody's taking the moment to forget about the disease. There's a thing that happens that we see with people who are progressing in the disease process, which is that family start to disappear friends start to disappear. Everybody is afraid of dementia. And the older we get, the closer we get, and the higher our risk is of getting it. Um, so when that starts to happen, that is actually promoting isolation. So we want to encourage people to make a new social network of friends. And that's what happens. I have couples who have now connected so much through the cafes, they're going out to dinner together. They're getting together at each other's houses. This is brilliant. And it's not hard to do. How many of you have hosted people at your house for dinner? Everybody. How 
many of you have thrown a birthday party or thrown an anniversary party? Yeah, it takes some planning and a little bit of executing, but it's easy. These are, I want you to think about this. These are the dominant feelings of someone who has dementia all day long. Think about that. The only time a person living with dementia has the opportunity to pr have a positive emotion, a positive moment in their day, is when we, as the caregiver, provide them the opportunity to do that. Because they're losing the ability to initiate, they're losing the ability to participate in things that they have the ability to do. Memory cafes make it failure free. There is no failure with attending a memory cafe. So think about how we, as a community, can create the opportunity for people to have a better quality of a day. Just by bringing a memory cafe into their couple hours of a day. So these are pictures of my first cafe, Create a Better Day. And we do entertainment and we have music, music therapy. Do you know the brain never forgets music memory? Never. If you want to see a really cool documentary, Alive Inside, where someone's very advanced, bedridden, unable to communicate, and they put headphones from music that's very familiar, and that individual starts singing. It's amazing. Pet therapy. Pet therapy is beautiful, but as long as you know the person likes the animal, that you have to make sure of, because you don't want to create trauma by bringing a dog in to someone who fears them. But pet therapy, proven <laughs> to actually lower blood pressure. Um, so mul multiple alternative therapies. So how do you set one up? Well, there's some steps you have to take. First of all, it takes a village. And it takes actually just one or two people who share the passion. So finding the location and knowing that that location is accessible to everyone, easy to find, Easy parking, easy access, welcoming environment. And I'm sure on Nantucket there are several places that meet that, those descriptions. Setting the date and time. And what we've done in our area is that every single memory cafe is on a different day and time. So none of them compete with each other, hence creating the opportunity for people to go to multiple ones. Getting a catchy name. We have the Time Out Cafe. We have the Comfort Food Caring Cafe. Lovely Linda's Lunches. Um, and on and on. Coming up with a catchy phrase. Um, options for activity. I always say music and entertainment just because that's across the board. Doesn't matter what the ability is, right? They have drum circles. There's a lots of, there's music and movement programs like Ageless Grace. Lots of different things that we can do to engage them in music. Some cafes will get into art projects, but what I find with that is that that singles out a few people, not only who might have that interest, but who have the ability to feel successful. And that's what we're trying to do, just a successful, failure-free environment. So how does this all get funded? Well, there's lots of different ways, because this is free. These cafes are free for the caregiver and their loved one to attend. So how do you sustain paying for a $150 entertainer and a couple hundred dollars maybe in food? Depends on who's involved. We have solicited sponsors. 
we have a lot of resources, but you do too. You have businesses in the community. Businesses who are willing to invest in their community to help us execute the memory cafes. Some cafes ask for donations, I don't. It's not about the money. We have to show them that we're just in it to help the community. There's grant funding out there. The cafes that we started in our area all started from grant funding. So if anybody has the opportunity or knowledge of how to write grants, memory cafes are the thing now. In, fa in fact, the Massachusetts Council on Aging, who has taken over all the efforts of dementia-friendly community, they have grants for that, for that kind of thing. Massachusetts Health Foundation, um, lots of different opportunities. But we have to remember, no matter what entity is offering dollars to the cafe, it is not a marketing opportunity. It is not about advertising your services. It's just about relationship building. So my sponsors who will give me a monthly stipend for the cafe, what they'll do is they'll be present and they'll start to meet people. And as you meet people, you want to know what they do. So that's their opportunity to get out what they do. OK? Um, this was at the Sudbury Senior Center. And this is what happens. The, the, the couple in the back who's dancing, she's very advanced. She's close to nonverbal. But what a way for him to pull his wife out into the community and engage and enjoy each other. That's the point. And then we have Minnesota and North Carolina. They're all over. And they're all different and unique, as I said before. So these are the things I want you to consider when you think about a person who is living with dementia. Real life experiences where in their day, they're dismissed. They're not acknowledged. They're isolated, as we spoke about. Loneliness is huge. Loneliness is not only an issue for our folks with dementia. It's also epidemic with our older adults living in the community. Loneliness is a terrible thing that will cause people to die young, younger as if they were. Um, the stigma, the stereotypes that go along with living with dementia, it's really sad. So many people, they won't go out to restaurants. They won't even go to church. They won't go to the grocery store with their loved one because it's embarrassing. There are some cultures out there that actually believe that living with dementia is a punishment from God. Or they are not to talk about it. It's all kept within the family. But we're trying to reverse that. We want people out in the community. Part of being dementia friendly is getting everybody educated on it, increasing awareness. I've taught many first responders, police, EMT, fire, part of the dementia friendly. They're the ones dealing with these people. Governor Baker, who just passed a law that all hospitals, all physicians, all nurses have to have dementia training finally. Why it took till 2018, I don't know. Maybe because everybody's seeing the epidemic as 78 million baby boomers are coming of age where they're going to be at risk. Why do you think, well, back on the mainland, um, Lots of memory care assisted livings are popping up everywhere. Everywhere you look, they're on the corner because they are banking on these numbers that are expected. There's no cure for the neurologically fatal dementia disease processes. The one number one biggest one is Alzheimer's. And no longer are we looking at Alzheimer's as the um, 85, 90 year old individual, people are living in their 50s, 
60s with this disease process. So what are other experiences? I want you to think of, has anybody heard of Maslow's hierarchy of need? We're all born with the physiological needs, food, clothing, shelter. Then we step up where we need to feel loved. We need to feel that we belong. There's a level of safety and security too in there. Where do we get our level of safety and security from? When we're born, as we're getting older, where does that sense of security and safety come from? Your parents, ideally. Ideally parents, but it's really, right. And it's usually from the person that has raised you, whether it's the grandmother, the stepfather, at the, somebody, right? It's as the disease progresses that we'll hear a person living with dementia ask for their mom or dad. Why? Because they are missing that piece of the hierarchy level of need. Maslow's needs. Next step up is building the self-esteem. Then eventually we reach a self-actualization a person who is diagnosed with dementia starts to slide down the other side of that triangle and loses a piece of the hierarchy of needs every single day. And um, the doctor spoke of purpose. That last point was absolutely what is missing in a person's life who has dementia. They've lost their sense of purpose. We all get up and we have a reason to get up and out and go on our day. But these folks living with dementia who have been asked to leave their jobs because they can't do their jobs anymore, we have to help them find another purpose. We can do that through memory cafes and dementia-friendly communities. Dr. Meissen calls it unforgettable therapy and my absolute favorite one that he's put on, time to forget about the forgetting. How cool is that, right? So these thoughts that he had in mind is that it's such a debilitating and devastating disease. It's also a journey of grief, the longest journey of grief for a family member of all the disease processes. People can live with dementia 18, 20 years, and that individual has to grieve the loss every single day because they're losing that person a little bit every single day. So why not build environments where we can get them out and engage? and have that human con connection. You know, the primary care physician might say, well, yeah, you got dementia, I'm gonna give you an Aricept, and I'm gonna give you a Namenda, and I'm gonna send you home, and I'll see you in six months, even a year. It might slow it down, but I'll tell you this, you have more risk of side effects from the medication. Social socialization has been proven to slow it down even more than that. So that's the key, is getting people engaged in their community. Um, celebrating the person, finding out the positive. Fo so many family members focus on what they can't do anymore, that that becomes the focus. We gotta change the way we think about dementia and focus on the can-dos. Focus on the interest. What can they still do and feel successful? The programming education that I do, it's finding out what works for that individual. We have a new cultural theory in healthcare called person-centered care. Gone are the days that we have a calendar and at one o'clock everybody's gonna play bingo. Although bingo will never die. Bingo's very popular. <laughs> Why do you think bingo's so cool? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know 
meet with the residents, you know, monthly for, you know, let the, you know, try and get more variety. If you try and take one bingo bag, you'll have your hat Think about what bingo is. It's, it's, it's almost like playing the lottery, kind of. Well, or Kino, right? Kino, maybe you can bring in Kino. There's a different winner and a different result every game. Makes it kind of exciting and it's not that hard. Okay. I'm sorry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Any reason to get together with people, human connection. Very important. These are his closing thoughts, which I just. I'm going to read. The Alzheimer's Cafe is a ritual for ridding oneself of fear, emotional separation, maintaining a long resistance against what is happening them, to them. Because it is so easy for them to just crawl in that hole and not come out. But a memory cafe and dementia-friendly community help them to get out of that. And we share it with friends, friends who are going through it. Support groups are wonderful. And I, I encourage people to engage in support groups. Very important for the caregiver. And once you connect with people who are in a similar journey like yourself, it helps. But what better way to be with those people without needing the tissue box, without needing to process all the grief, but just going to have fun and dancing with your spouse or your partner or your loved one. It's easy. So what is dementia friendly, age friendly? What does all that mean? It means removing stigma, increasing awareness and allowing people to be participants in their community. And everybody's aging in the community. How can we make the community better? Older adults in the community, they've been through a lifetime of experience, yet we're not focusing on how do we create a better community of inclusiveness for our older adults. Think about that. So what can your community do is that we can identify the needs, which I know in Nantucket has already been done. Big, big, big study to determine what the needs are of this community. And guess what? Lots more programs, lots more services, lots more things need to happen in order to main, meet the goals of what this community needs, okay? Um, I want you to start thinking about if you do nothing here to address creating dementia-friendly, age-friendly, picture this Nantucket community in 10, 20, 30 years. What is it gonna look like? What are we going to be doing with those folks who are isolated in their homes. And when I say a journey, it's a journey. Because in the beginning of dementia, what happens with a person is that they don't need physical care. They don't need hands-on care for their what we call ADLs. You know, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, eating, what you and I do every day. That's not what they need. They need to feel accepted and included, and they need human connection, okay? This is what you can do. You can be part of the solution by helping to create memory cafes. It takes a little bit of training if you have no knowledge about what dementia is, what Alzheimer's is, what, just a little bit of education. That's all it takes. So this is my favorite, favorite poem by Maya Angelou. It's actually on the back of my business card. 
because that is the life of a person living with dementia. They will never forget how you make them feel. <clears throat> Thank you. So, we hope you like this show. Um, and the reason for it is that Alison Forsgren has already had a meeting of folks who are, who, whom she's trying to develop into the committee to develop a memory cafe right here in Nantucket. And there's a lot of models for this. If you folks are interested in volunteering for this uh, or interested in being involved and staying in touch, Allison, there is an email address. DementiaFriendlyNantucket at gmail.com. So just Dementia Friendly Nantucket at gmail.com. If you want further information or want to be involved, this is like a great initiative. It's a crucial piece of creating a place where Frank and Mary can, as we all talk about, live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. So if, if Frank's or Mary have got memory problems, they need to be knowing about this and there needs to be this, this, this wonderful kind of cafe available to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Arthur.